is on fire. I want to read from Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7 and verse 1. Woe is me. Notice these words carefully. For I am like those who gather summer fruits. Like those who glean vintage grapes. There is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth. And there is no one upright among them. Well, that's a sad statement. The faithful man has perished from the earth. There is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. That they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe and the great man utters his evil desire so they scheme together. Does that sound familiar? The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Do not trust in a friend. I think how intense this is. Do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father. Daughter rises against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. So we've been just painted here in the first, you know, six or seven verses, a pretty dire social climate. And the prophet Micah is showing us a picture of what's happening in the world. It's on fire. (laughs) The world is on fire. And then verse seven. Now I say this often, of course, it starts off with therefore, and I've heard this said, and I'll say it to you again. Anytime there's a therefore, you need to ask what it's there for. When therefore is put in the scripture, it's saying, okay, based on everything that you've heard in verse one through six, here is the solution. Therefore, because of verses one through six, verse seven says, here's how we respond to a world on fire. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until, somebody say until, he pleads my cause and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. In the day when your walls are to be built. In the day the decree shall go far and wide. In that day they shall come to you from Assyria and the fortified cities. From the fortress to the river, from sea to sea and mountain to mountain. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff. That's what we say to the Lord today. 
Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitarily in a woodland, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in days of old. Notice that, as in days of old, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. The nation shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hands over their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God. And shall say, who is a God like you? (laughs) Who is a God like our God? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever. Because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us. And will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. I know that's an extensive amount of reading, but I believe the message is going to be plain. I believe the message is going to be uh, simple today, and that is... How do you respond when the world is on fire? Now, Micah described the spiritual crisis in his day. And (laughs) those first six verses really show us just kind of the climate um, of crisis that they were living in. Society itself was filled with sin and betrayal. And it describes that father against son. Daughter against mother. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Verses 1 through 6, the words resound in my ear. And I just want to go back over them with you and and soak in these words as the Lord really kind of helps us see we're in a very similar time, a very similar spiritual climate. How many of you know we are in a crisis right now? In the world, we're in a crisis in the church, we're in a crisis in America, we're in a crisis economically, we're in a crisis as far as safety within our streets, national defense, economically, all of these things. And he starts off in verse one by saying, woe is me. That's not a popular phrase. Woe is me. Why does he say that? Why would anyone say, woe is me? Well, verse 2, he tells you the reasons why he said, woe is me. And they're significant reasons. He said, woe is me because the faithful man has perished from the earth. Those who seem to be faithful to God, to, to country, to family, those kind, every kind of measurement of faithfulness, he said, it's gone. Nobody sticks with anything anymore. The faithful man has perished from the earth. Those who stick to something or stick with something, whether it be walking with the Lord, pursuing the Lord, worshiping the Lord, attending a church, whatever it might be. He says they're, 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 the time that he was referencing when he said, woe was me, is that All faithfulness of every kind of measurement and sphere has perished from the earth. That is enough to say, woe is me. And there is no one. Somebody say, no one. Now that's not good. No one upright among them. That narrows it down. No one. It doesn't just say, Anyone or someone, but no one, not one. Of course, I think the words in the New Testament, there is none righteous, no, not one. But there is no one upright among them. And then he describes what that looks like when there's nobody upright. 
amongst the people in this climate of spiritual crisis. Here's the sign that uprightness has left the building. Every man hunts his brother with a net. Now, if you have ever probably watched or seen movies when somebody, especially in older movies, they would go up and they'd take this great big fishing net and they would throw it on someone that they were trying to capture or attack or, or kidnap. Well, when that big net is thrown over you, it's like your hands, your fingers are stuck within the net. You don't know how to respond. You don't know where the lifting point is. It's like you've just been covered or shrouded with a web of knots connected to one another, cast over you. So it prohibits you from being able to defend yourself or get free. And if the net is pulled, then it can completely take your control away to even stand up and certainly not be able to defend yourself. And he says that in this spiritual crisis, in this uh, climate, every man is looking to do that to his brother, to catch them and actually go hunting looking for looking for a brother every man hunts going hunting got their sights set as marksman hunts his brother with a net to catch them like fish with a net that is a bad environment the Bible says in the book of James, where there is strife, envy, jealousy, there is every kind of evil work when, there's in, when that kind of thing is involved. And then I want you to notice something he says next, and this really drives the point home because this is not just true within some of the church world, but it's also true in society. He says, the prince... Somebody say, that's the politician. The prince asks for gifts. In other words, I'll bid out my agenda to the largest donors. If you can sow this much into my campaign, I'll make sure that the policy that's important to you gets passed. And in our nation, of course, congressmen and women and senators and obviously even presidents and, 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 and mayors and governors and all this. He says, the prince, the political leader, asks for gifts. How many times have we heard news commercials just recently in this primary election season? We heard this phrase, bought and paid for. Anybody else heard that? If you haven't, hold on, there's about... I don't know, eight more months, you'll hear it, a lot of it, bought and paid for by this interest group, a special interest group. So there's the prince asking for gifts. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. The judge, somebody say, the judicial system. The judicial system is corrupt. The judge seeks a bribe. The judge is desiring someone to bribe him on the side. In fact, a certain DA may even try to work with the judge to make sure your political opponent is stopped from being able to run against you. But I've always found, isn't it bizarre how that when your whole life is driven by the gotcha narrative, that always comes back to home to roost. There are people who devote entire ministries just to find fault with others. I mean, that is what every single show cast episode they do is nitpicking criticizing others. And, that, and, and there's a real negative spirit with that because you sow that seed, you'll get that harvest back. You always reap what you sow. 
the judge seeks a bribe. When we have politicians who run for office and say, if you'll elect me as the DA, on video, if you elect me, I'll get Trump. You show me the man, I'll find the crime. This is what's happening right now, even in the United States of America. It shouldn't be happening. This stuff typically usually happens in a banana republic. But the, the presumptive nominee of one of the two major parties is embroiled in lawsuits that, frankly, now even the left is saying, this seems bizarre. This is a little over the top. This is going too far. And every indictment increases his popularity. And then he says, and the great man utters his evil desire. These are people who are highly influential. Social media uh, people. Social icons. People with great money. Business owners. People with great wealth. They utter their evil desire so they scheme together. There's nothing worse than influencers Corrupt judges and corrupt politicians come together. There's nothing that can create more of a hostile environment and a crisis. And it was in Micah's day, so this isn't the first time this has happened. They scheme together. That means they get together and figure out how can the prince use his power? How can the judge use his power? How could, can we find somebody to bribe the judge? Can we find the great influencer, somebody well-known, somebody with a lot of followers, somebody with a big name or a lot of money? Can they work with the justice system and the politicians to see if we can find or get someone that is in opposition to us? They scheme together. Lord, help us. Verse 4. Your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Do not trust a friend. So if you thought it was bad enough, you know, in the previous verse, where he tells us the faithful man has perished, no one's upright among them, every man's trying to catch his brother with a net so he can't break free. He's, he's, he's caught. And the, the politicians, the judges, and the social media influencers and the wealthy people are scheming together while the faithful man has perished and there's no one upright among them. If that's not bad enough, now he says in verse 5, it's so hostile, it's such a spiritual crisis in the culture, you can't even trust in a friend. It's, in the, it's right in the word. Do, in, that, in that context, Micah the prophet, he's warning, do not trust in a friend. Now, nobody wants to hear that. We all need friends. And I believe God can supernaturally provide you friends. For a son dishonors father. And daughter rises against her mother. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. How tragic is it that the people that are hostile to you the most are the people that share the similar DNA or the same family name? I'm not blaming any one person. Uh, I'm just saying it is a bad thing when the people who fight against you the most are those of your own household. Son against father. Jesus even referenced this later on. He, he said that this would be a sign associated with the last days. Daughter against her mother, and so on and so forth. So Micah identifies the primary leaders who will scheme together to lead society into spiritual darkness and depravity. The princes 
Government leaders, the judges, the legal and the court systems, and the great leaders, leaders in religion, religious leaders, leaders in the, the economy, military leaders, leaders in education, media, athletics, social media icons, they all scheme together. Now Jesus revealed that this, what Micah saw in his day, would emerge again in an even worse way in the last end time generation at the end of the age and it would be fueled by anger against the gospel mark chapter 13 and verse 10 tells us that but verse 8 look at this mark 13 verse 8 for nation will rise against nation ethnos from whence we get the word ethnicity there'll be ethnic wars ethnos against ethnos racial wars there will be earthquakes you will be brought before rulers and kings. There's the ruler and kings. There's the princes that he's talking about that remember want gifts. Very much like Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas who wanted to eliminate Jesus because of his influence with the people. You must be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. Now brother will betray brother to death. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. And when you see the abomination of desolation, let those who are in Judea flee. So what do we do in response to this crisis that I've just summarized? And I think you could all agree that we see very similar threads in our world and our culture and our nation and some even in the church that we see in Micah chapter 7 verse 1 through 6. Where have all the faithful gone? Where has the uprightness gone? Why are people trying to devour and bite one another and Hunt one another down, skeptical and suspicious of each other. And then you got problems in the judicial system. The political system has corruption. The judicial, judicial system has corruption. And they co conspire, co inspire, if you will, with people who have high status in the world, great men. So what do you do when all this happens? And then it hits, it's not just a Wall Street. It's, it's not even just at Main Street because he talks about princes, judges, great influencers. And then he says, father and son, son against father, daughter against mother. In other words, this is going to climax right and hit you right where it hurts the most, in the home. In the domestic scenario. And so he gives us answers. Yeah, I just felt the weight of the Holy Spirit come in the room. Here he gives us solution. He tells us what to do. Starting in verse 7. Remember verse 1 through 6 was the bad news. Then verse 7, he tells you this is how you can respond. The people of God can respond to this prophetic word of Micah in chapter 7. And what Micah told them to do and what Micah said, this is how you should respond. This is also how we should respond to the same situation. In Micah chapter 7 verse 7, Therefore, because of all of this, verse 1 through 6, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. What does that mean? Sounds too simple. It sounds oversimplified. Well, the truth is, how many things do we look to other than God? If you get your eyes on men, men will fail you. If you're depending on your ship to come in, if you're depending on everything to suddenly turn around and go your way and have a good string of good luck, if, if you're waiting or looking to the economy or to the business world or to even the right politician, which it does matter who the leaders of the nation are, but 
those things cannot be what you look to for ultimate hope in the midst of a spiritual catastrophe. When the faithful are gone, what do you do? Look to God. Pray and wait on him to act to openly fulfill his promise. He said, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. You know what this says to me? This says in the time of a great spiritual crisis when the world is on fire, the people of God have to be different than the rest. We have to more than ever before get our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, get in the secret place, wait on the Lord, wait patiently upon him until he comes, wait for revelation for divine strategies to know how to respond, waiting for the God of my salvation. And then he says boldly, my God will hear me. That is when the believer says, I know it's dark. I know the faithful man has fallen. I know uprightness has left the land. I know there's corruption in politics, judicial system, and there's people with a lot of money and influence that are corrupt. But I believe with all of my heart, when I pray, God will hear me. <laughs> Hallelujah. My God will hear me. You got to start believing again that God will hear and answer your prayer. When you've looked to everything else, look to the Lord completely. Wait for the God. Wait for him, for the God of your salvation, for the God of my Yeshua. God wants to restore your faith right now when the world is on fire. He wants to call the people of God. So goes the church, so goes the world. He wants judgment to begin in the house of God. And part of that judgment is we've looked to a lot of things. We've looked and called a lot of things revival. We've, look, we've called a, looked to a lot of things to bring us success. But we are going to look to the Lord with a narrow focus, not looking to the left, not looking to the right. Our division isn't divided. divided. No, we're going to look to the Lord and then we're going to wait on him. We're going to carve time out of our schedule on purpose to wait on him, to hear from him, to commune with him, to fellowship with him because in his presence is fullness of joy. If you've lost the joy of the Lord, it's because you've stayed out of his presence too much. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. I tell you, when, when all of life, when the world's on fire, and you're tempted to succumb to discouragement or depression or darkness, and he talks about this in a minute when he says, I sit in darkness. You can probably relate at just a time where it seems like darkness is all around you. You can't see your hand in front of your face. The world grows dark. But he says in the midst of a spiritual crisis, in the midst of a falling society, when the world is on fire, I will look to the Lord. I'm going to get closer to him. That's going to be the main thing. And the main thing's going to remain the main thing. I've got to get closer to the Lord. I've got to look exclusively to the Lord for my answer, for my solution. I've got to look to him, get my eyes off of this stuff. Get my eyes even off of watching the news all the time because that'll get you discouraged. Get your eyes off what's happening on social media or who's saying what or who's, who's ever having a mic drop moment. Let that stuff get out of your vision and get your eyes back on the Lord and make the determination, I'm going to get closer to the Lord than anybody else. I'll wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Remember, Jesus said, what's over things you ask in my name when you pray? Believe that you will receive them. So looking to the Lord and a restored confidence in God's ability and willingness to answer prayer. The second thing he says is to have confidence in God's faithfulness even in the face of great darkness. 
And then he says to patiently bear the discipline and the chastising of the Lord. And then respond in deep repentance. So we read verse 7, looking to the Lord, my God will answer my prayer. Now verse 8, do not rejoice over me. It starts to turn, you see that there? Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall, not if I fall, when I fall. Now some people fall differently than others. Some people fall and it's seen and some people fall and it's not seen. When I fall, I will arise. Not I might. I will. I may have gotten knocked down. I may have stumbled or tripped. Maybe you feel that way today. When I fall, I will arise. I won't be the same person that I was before. I'm going to see where I got tripped up. And when I fall, I will arise. Look at this. When, not if, but when, there will come a time, I will sit in darkness, but the Lord will be a light to me. There is nothing in the world like having a real dark moment in your life where all hope and all joy seems to have gotten uh, out of you, your, the reach of your grasp. And darkness settles in on you. You begin to question everything. You begin to wonder, does it matter? Do I matter? You begin to wonder, what should I do? What should I not do? You begin to wonder, does God even see me? Does God even hear me? Does it matter if I show up and I'm counted and named among the, the righteous? Does it matter? Darkness can come over you where you feel a sense of hopelessness and despair. But I want to tell you today that when you sit in darkness, God can suddenly break through the darkness today somebody's light breakthrough moment where the light penetrates the darkness and the Lord will be a light to you hallelujah and then he says in verse 9 I will bear the indignation of the Lord notice he didn't say I'll bear the indignation of men I will bear the indignation of the Lord. Listen, I fear getting disciplined by the Lord more than I do a whole company of people coming after me. If you really understood how powerful and awesome and sovereign our God is, knowing that you've come under the weight of his judgment, judgment begins at the house of the Lord. If you know the Lord chastens those who he loves and receives as sons. When you have to bear the indignation of the Lord because you are aware you've sinned against him, whether people know about it or not, because I've sinned against him, there are sometimes I have to bear the indignation of the Lord. But there's an until moment. How long will it last? I don't know. How long will I have to bear the indignation of the Lord? I don't know. How long will I have to sit in darkness? I don't know. How long will my enemies rejoice over me? I don't know. But I know that the light will come in. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't raise the white flag. The Lord will be a light to me. I'm speaking to somebody right now in the name of the Lord. The Lord is going to penetrate the darkness in your life right now and invade your darkness with that light from above. That light which light every man that comes into the world. John the Baptist said, I'm not that light, but I'm sent to bear witness to that light that all men through him, through Christ, would believe. How long will the indignation of the Lord last against me under his judgment? I don't know. But I accept it because I have sinned against him. I have, you have. But here's the encouraging part. I don't know when. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, maybe next week, next month, I don't know. 
But the Lord is going to intervene, invade the darkness with the light, remove the indignation and the chastisement. Weeping may endure in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And I know sooner or later, get this now, you've got to hear this if you hear nothing else I say. Something supernatural happens when you're under this weight of indignation and you're under this weight of failure and your enemies rejoicing over you and sitting in darkness and bearing the indignation of the Lord. That's a heavy load to carry to know that you've sinned against him or you're, you've come short of his glory. But there's something supernatural about that moment when suddenly God says enough is enough. I'm now going to plead his case, her case. My little children, John said, my little children, he said, I would that you wouldn't sin. <laughs> but if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's the one that will plead my case. He's the one that can speak up and say, Father, Father, Hear my blood speaking on their behalf. Their sin may be crying out. The stains that they've left in their environment and atmosphere, the imprint of their iniquity in their social circle may be warring against them constantly. But the voice of the blood of Jesus is greater and more powerful than the blood of Abel which cries guilty, guilty, guilty. The Lord's going to plead your case. <laughs> oh, that ought to give you hope today. You say, no one can plead my case. Nobody's defending me. Nobody's standing with me. I'm alone. Everybody looks down on me. No one is my advocate. Well, when your heart is turned in true and full and deep repentance and you're willing to say, I'll bear this darkness and this indignation. I don't know how long it'll last, but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to continually threaten the Lord that I'm going to quit if he doesn't intervene and change when I say he has to. No, I'm going to bear this. And let me tell you, sometimes spiritual warfare is just like that. You don't take on a principality by yourself. You don't try to overthrow the powers of darkness over the city. Sometimes you just have to endure like a good soldier. Now, yeah, there's times to use your spiritual authority. We together have the mind of Christ and we can pray and go into a time of prayer and fasting and God can break, like Isaiah 58 says, he can break the bonds of wickedness. But what you need desperately is for the Lord to plead your case and look, he will bring me forth to the light. Pray that the Lord would intervene in power to fulfill his promise. How many of you have promises personally? And are aware of the ones given to us in Scripture, promises, that you're waiting on and you refuse to give up on even though you've been tempted to. Lord, we need you to intervene in power in our nation. We need you to intervene in power in the church. We need you to intervene in the judicial system, the political system. We need you to intervene in the church, in church leadership. We need your intervention. And what kind of intervention do we need? Well, the Lord answered Micah's prayer by promising him that he would show great miracles to Israel in the time of spiritual crisis when the world was on fire. He said, I'll do miracles for you then and now like I did for them. I'm talking about Red Sea parton level miracles. I'm talking about pillar of fire by night leading you. Supernatural guidance. Pillar of cloud by day. I'm talking about manna in the wilderness kind of provision level miracle where God intervenes and fights for you and listen to me I want somebody to hear this today this is the word of the Lord the Lord will fight for you every day he's restoring that promise shepherd your people verse 14 with your staff 
as in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them wonders. I will show them wonders. What is that? I don't know. It makes you wonder. The nation shall see and shall be afraid of the Lord. Oh, would to God amidst this world on fire that the fear of the Lord would return back to the world. Just like in Acts chapter 5, after Ananias and Sapphira lied to Peter, they both basically fall over and die. And the Bible responds there in Acts chapter 5, verse 11. It says, great fear came upon the believers. And what was the result after the fear of the Lord was restored? It said, and great miracles and signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostles. They were all in unity together in Solomon's porch. Even the rest of the world that would not join them respected them again. And the Lord greatly added to the church where even Simon Peter's shadow could heal the sick. That, all those things that I just said happened after the fear of the Lord was the response to the Ananias and Sapphira event. Miracles, signs, and wonders, unity in the church, the world respecting the church again, even if they're not joining the, the kingdom, unity amongst the believers... Isn't that awesome? Yes. Yes. And the Lord added greatly the harvest. So miracles, unity, the world respects the church again and fears God again. And the harvest, the Lord added and multiplied to the church. It's right there in your Bible, Acts chapter 5, verse 11 through about 15. Sixth thing is worship the Lord for his unique kindness, even in pardoning the sins, the us sins, our sins, of the surviving remnant. He says, worship the Lord. If that's all you got left, just worship the Lord. And then delight in mercy towards others because God delights in mercy. Do you hear that? God delights in mercy. Verse 18, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity. Passing over the transgression of the remnant. He does not retain his anger forever. Aren't you glad for that? People may stay mad at you, but God doesn't. Because he delights he delights. He doesn't just, well, I guess I got to be merciful. He delights. He looks for an opportunity to rejoice in showing mercy. He will have compassion on us. How many of you need the compassion of the Lord? He will subdue our iniquities, our weaknesses, our sins. And I love this. You'll cast our sins in the depths of the sea. Listen, man has went to the moon. We've sent robots to Mars. We've orbited the earth. But there's one place man has never been able to go. And that's at the very depths of the ocean. Because in the deepest parts of the ocean... There's pressures there that's just about impossible for man to, to descend to the lowest depths of the ocean without that pressure caving in whatever vessel they're in. The Lord said, I'm going to put your sin in the place where even man, with all his technology in 2024, can't get to it. Cast our sins into the sea. This is what God is looking for right now. He is looking for a people 
when the world is on fire, to turn to the Lord. When politics and the justice system and all the things we believed in and uprightness and righteousness and faithful people disappear and family turns against you. Micah just gave us prophetic revelation on how the people of God should respond. And you see seven or eight little points here that if we'll follow this, it doesn't matter how dark it gets, yeah, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the peoples, but the glory of the Lord will shine upon you and rise upon you. Let's lift our hands and thank the Lord for his goodness. When the world is on fire, there's a God in heaven who delights in mercy and his anger does not last forever forever. 